marked for death. Laglow's place was loud. The bugman since drought in her tankard was rich and strong, and Admiral Imoda Barristota was some distance from sobriety. A pint or ten helped these days with the memories. The conversation droned on around her. Everything spun about, Admiral Ruftson was saying, grinding the heel of one palm into an empty eye socket. The Starlings in flames, seven of the Sylvan Council dead, and the Sunderer destroyed. Two seats from the Gelserat to those Wazaks from Barak Mornir. In strife there is opportunity, said Admiral Brulf, wagging a gloved finger. The Aether streams are settling at last, and Barak Zilfin's already claimed more than her fair share. We've gained a seat at the high table ourselves, don't forget. Ruftson grunted, seemingly annoyed at this reminder that all was not disastrous. Ismoda watched him reach into the pocket of his flight suit and retrieve his athermetic eyepiece, jamming it into place. It whirred and clicked before fixing on her. Of course, there's some that made their fortune out of all of this, Ruftson said. Like the good Admiral Ismoda here. I hear tell the Council's granted you the lease of two brand-new frigates, fresh from the dockyard, upgunned and swift as a Haitian zephyr, so it's said. Fortune shines on some more than others, doesn't it? The old greybeard could hardly hide his envy. Ruftson was an old hand, a steady sky-dog who could be relied upon to keep his margins stable and his hole filled with either gold, but he was never going to rise any further than his current station. He lacked imagination. And dash. Imoda smiled bitterly as she leaned forward, waving a hand through her hair. She was barely half Ruftson's age, but she had a whiter mane than he and her face was deeply lined and pallid. This was no natural weathering, but the result of her last voyage, a journey that had taken her damned close to oblivion. Talk to me of my good fortune, O oh wise one, she snarled. Perhaps you'd say the same of my crew, or those few that survived that flight through the Granthian Mountains with geists, Oskuldrak, and Grungi alone knows what else at our heels. She felt a hand on her shoulder, and turned to see Grutier Phaedrin Sador standing over her. Her first mate wore a familiar look of concern. Admiral, the repairs are complete, Grutty said. The interligo is sky-ready again. Perhaps you'd like to look over her yourself. Imoda favoured Admiral Ruftson with another sour look. The greybeard matched her with a glare of his own, while Admiral Brulf simply shook his head and took another swig of fire ale. This was not the first time Moda had lost her patience in recent days. She rose abruptly from her chair, sending it skidding backwards across the polished stone floor. Aye, she said. Apologies, friends, for my ill temper. I've shares in this establishment. Tell Laglo I said your drinks are on me for the evening. Time for me to retire to my cabin, I think. She favoured them with the merest nod and departed, doing her best not to sway as she pushed her way through the heaving mass of patrons towards the rear exit of the tavern. Grotty followed close behind, her concern as grating as it was silent. The first mate's prosthetic leg clicked maddeningly as she walked, every sound causing Imoda to flinch. After spending the necessary shares to repair the battered interlago, there had been little left to pay for a proper athmatic limb to replace the one Grutti had lost on that nightmarish journey through the Granthian range, where the Ironclad's crew had found the risen dead crawling in their multitudes and a gaping maw of utter nothingness that was growing upon the hour. So powerful had been the aura of death that merely approaching it had taken a grievous toll on Imoda, 
She recalled the dreadful sensation of her body weakening, her hair falling loose, and her breaths coming in ragged gasps. There was something terrible brewing in Shaman. She knew it in her bones. But the Admiral's council was too busy grasping at their newly settled aether streams to heed her warnings. And what could she do alone? Admiral, said Gruffy, I am as hale as a harkraken, Emoji replied irritably. Stop your fussing. They shoved their way out of the bar, dodging a steady stream of milling labourers and half-cut archonauts, making the most of their shore leave. Aish had made its descent some hours back, and the metal walkways were lit with spluttering whaling oil lamps that cast spidery shadows along the walls. The air was thick and hot, spiced with the metallic tang of aether hydrants and the aroma of roast ligral meat. Everywhere, the cacophony of the Zilfin outer docks bellowed laughter and song, the distant piping of the longshore marshal's whistles, the signal that some troublemaker was about to feel the taste of a billy club. Before her last voyage, Emoda Baristota would have delighted in such liveliness. Right now, she longed for the cool and the quiet of her quarters and the comfort of her maps. We'll take Uncleman's bridge, she said. It was a slightly longer route, but the great skyway neatly avoided the hustle and bustle of the skyport's outer districts. They could hail down an engine tram and be back aboard the ironclad without braving any more merrymakers. In silence they made their way through the labyrinthine streets of Barrack Zilfin, each of them so familiar with its cramped passageways that they could have made the journey blindfolded. As they entered the square of the Sixth Wind, Emoda paused, frowning. She scanned the plaza with its gently bubbling lamps and benches of ornately sculpted bronze. No sign of movement. Why then had a cold shiver trickled down her back? Her hand fell to the butt of the pistol at her belt. She was wearing a simple duster of whaling hide rather than her war suit, but this did not mean she was unarmed. Admiral? asked Grutty, eyes furrowed in alarm. She had good reason to be confused. There were scant few cut purses or back alley blades that dared ply their trade in Barrack Zilfin, where the law of the code was enforced with vigorous enthusiasm. Someone follows us, whispered Imoda. Be ready with your scattergun, I can. Before she could finish the sentence, she felt a rush of wind past her face, as if a crossbow bolt had whipped through the air. There was a blur and a black of silver, and Grutty fell away, reeling, her lifeblood splattered across the cobbles. Grutty! roared the Admiral, and in the blink of an eye her pistol was in her hand and spitting aether shot. She fired from the hip, tracking the thing's movement as it turned and leapt impossibly high. It was too fast, unnaturally fast. As it landed, Emoda caught the vague impression of a tall, thin human male, his hair a cascading wave of silver, and eyes as red as the new dawn. Then he was coming right at her, a needle-thin dagger poised to open her throat. Dropping her pistol, she somehow caught hold of the creature's thin, pale forearm. The dagger tip scraped across the collar of her duster. She was looking into the thing's face now, the fish-white flesh of her corpse, splattered with her crewmate's blood, the eyes crimson and feral. As she fought in vain to keep the slender blade from opening her throat, her attacker opened his thin mouth in a mocking smile, revealing a pair of yellowed fangs. The foul corpse reek of his breath brought her right back to the mountains, and the horrors concealed below. Did you think the death would not find you here? It rasped. Nowhere is beyond the Blood Queen's influence. Neverata's reach spans the realms entire. Then she could have come for me herself. Imoda brought a knee up into the vampire's belly and followed it with a headbutt. The assassin barely staggered. He simply chortled, a high-pitched childish sound that chilled her to the bone. 
With a single twist of his skinny frame, he sent her spinning to the floor. She crushed down hard, and he straddled her, the point of his blade tickling her eyeball. You were marked for death as soon as you laid eyes upon my mistress's work, he whispered. She demands that you suffer for your interference. I will make this very, very slow. The knife scraped across Imoda's eyeball, and she roared in agony. The vampire gasped, a wet, rattling sound. Through the haze of pain, Imoda saw its chest glow white-hot, then burst as a blinding bright crystal sword punched through bone. Self-indulgence is such a dangerous trait, said a soft voice, beautifully melodic and utterly composed. You should have just killed her. The vampire snarled, somehow still trying to rise with a smoking hole in its chest. Emoda, her left eye a ball of white-hot pain, scrabbled onto the floor and found her pistol, her fingers closed around its comforting metal grip. She pressed it between the vampire's fangs and fired. Its skull exploded in a shower of viscera. The headless body toppled aside, revealing a tall, graceful warrior, wielding a sword made of sunlight. An elf, but not like any she had seen before. His armour gleamed a blinding silver, and he wore a soaring back banner fashioned in the shape of a sun. Such a needlessly elaborate adornment that Imoda might have scoffed had she not marked the elf's pose and assured manner, his steely gaze, and the way he carried that blade, like it was an extension of his arm. This was a warrior born. It would have paid to keep the creature alive, Elethor, came another voice, higher in pitch than that of the sword-wielder, but carrying many the same note of supreme confidence, as well as a tinge of reproach. It might have told us many interesting things, were we to properly encourage it. It belonged to another elf, who crouched low over the body of poor Grutty. This one was as striking as her twin, clad in robes of azure, and carrying a staff whose crystal head glowed with the same blinding radiance as her kinsman's sword. Direct your irritation to this one, said the warrior, nodding at Imoda. She was the one who blew its head off. Grutty, gasped Imoda, wincing as she dragged herself to her feet. She could feel the piercing burn of a broken rib. What was left of her eye was trickling down her face. She hauled herself over to where her first mate lay, crumpled and bleeding on the cobbles. Your friend might live said the female elf, with stark indifference. I thought such a blow would surely kill her. Shall I take your gratitude for our timely rescue as implied? Take it and stow it any way you wish, elf, Imoda snapped. Had you intervened sooner, I'd not be sure of one eye, and my first mate wouldn't be lying in her own blood. Who are you, anyway? My name is Elena, and this is my brother, Elethor. We have heard the rumours of your voyage to the Granthian Mountains, and the things you have witnessed there. You will tell us your tale. Leave nothing out. I do not exaggerate when I say that millions of lives depend on it. 